afternoon and welcome to episode number 83 of At Your Service with Haber and Martinez. I am Haber, that's Martinez, and right below us is our guest, Dr. Michael P. Brannan, forensic psychologist extraordinaire. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be talking today about Miranda rights. I've titled the show Miranda Rights, Debunking Myths and Suppressing Statements. So just by way of brief background so that everybody understands where we're going with this show, one of the most common things that we come across as defense attorneys is the lack of knowledge of the general public on what Miranda rights really are, what they really mean, and what the consequences of any Miranda violation happens to be. So I'm sure Ed's heard this many times. We get questioned and sometimes even challenged by clients or potential clients as to why is their case not getting dismissed because they weren't read Miranda. That's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. That's the debunking myths. In terms of suppressing statements, Dr. Brannon is our ace in the hole, as he often is in criminal court. Dr. Brannon is a psychologist. He's been practicing for, what, about 35 years now? 30, 35 years, Doc? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's hard to keep track. It's about yep. as long as I've been practicing law. But Dr. Brannon is not the type of psychologist that you're going to go to when you have an emotional problem and need somebody's shoulder to cry upon. Not that he's not competent to do that, but that's not where his niche is. Dr. Brannon specializes in an area of psychology called forensic psychology, which is the marriage, if you will, of the court system and the science of psychology. It is the application of psychology to various areas of the court structure. So in his practice, Dr. Brannon handles all sorts of things. Uh, he's handled criminal cases, guardianship cases, probate cases, personal injury, juvenile delinquency, dependency, immigration. And in these arenas, he does a variety of things. We usually employ him specifically and strictly in the criminal arena because that's where we uh, work. But again, Dr. Brannon, who has been qualified as an expert witness uh, thousands of times in both state and federal court and a variety of different types of platforms, both for adults and juveniles, uh, is extremely, extremely helpful in assisting us <coughs> in our home issues and to get judges and or juries to side with us. So today's discussion is going to deal with Miranda, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the ideas and concepts and how Dr. Brannon helps us in a courtroom, but also we're going to talk about those myths and explain to you what exactly Miranda is. And I'd like to start by talking to you a little bit about who was Miranda, because everybody's heard the words Miranda rights or Miranda warnings. Some of you who didn't go to law school may be familiar with the actual Supreme Court case, Miranda versus Arizona. But what is Miranda, Arizona? How did Miranda, Arizona ever appear in front of the Supreme Court in the first place? Well, it all started with an arrest. Doc, you want to you want to tell the audience a little about that? Well, I mean, sure. No, th and thanks for thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be with you all. Um, so the, the Miranda case, of course, a very famous and noteworthy uh, you know case in terms of the legal community that really talks about and we'll go into this more uh, person's rights before they say anything to police. Um, and Miranda, interestingly enough, um, Ernesto Miranda in 1973 was a gentleman who had a variety of cases, had four different cases. And uh, those cases were consolidated. Um, he was. Uh, he froze. He um, froze up on us. I froze? Yeah. Right when can you, you hear said me? Four, yeah, now we can hear you. Right when you yeah. said his four, cases, I, his four right. cases were consolidated. And am I, am I moving now? Can you see me yep. moving? Yeah, we got animated once so again. Four cases were consolidated. And uh, Miranda was uh, questioned. Ernesto Miranda was questioned by police. But he wasn't told that he could have an attorney and wasn't told that he didn't have to talk to the police. So in essence, he wasn't given any sort of idea about anyone that could assist or help him and what the consequences might be of him speaking. He was eventually um, convicted um, in, uh, in Arizona. Um, he was convicted of rape and kidnapping, given a very long uh, criminal sentence. Um, and then what happened was it was appealed to the Arizona Supreme Court, um, which upheld uh, the conviction later went up to the United States Supreme Court that overturned the conviction on a 5 4 vote. So Miranda was actually released at that time. So, an interesting scenario, in that here was really um, the landmark case in regards to a person being warned and advised about their, their talking to police. 
So let me let me chime in and just say a couple of other things so the guys, the audience gets the context. So first off, Miranda, uh, Ernesto Miranda was a Mexican uh, 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 citizen who was arrested in Arizona 10 days after a female victim had reported a rape and a kidnapping. He was picked out of a police lineup. So there are all sorts of issues in regards to this case. And part of the big issue on appeal was exactly what the doc said, because after a two hour interrogation, Ernesto Miranda signed a written confession form that had been typed and prepared by the law enforcement officers who interrogated him. And on that form at the very bottom, you know, anybody who's ever signed a contract or a legal document, there's always fine print on the bottom. Or even when you buy apps these days or sign up for social media, that check the I agree to terms and conditions. Well, how many of you actually read that stuff? Because on the bottom of Ernesto's confession, his written confession, was printed language. I won't, you know, read off the exact words, but it basically said, I hereby affirm and understand that I had the right to remain silent and I had the right to speak to a lawyer. But nobody ever told him that. No one ever expressed it to him, nor was there any indication that he could read it understand it or appreciate it. So basically what the cops did back in ni- in the early, uh, actually this was 73, I think. Yes, yeah, 73. So whenever the cops did this, they were pulling a little cutesy move, right? They were basically having you swear <laughs> that they advised you of stuff that they didn't actually advise you of. And that's what the Supreme Court ultimately came down upon and said, no, 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 you can't do that. The other cases, just so I can read them off and I won't get into well, the fact Mike, I just want to say one thing about Miranda and about these confessions, just in general, as we speak and we go forward. Because a lot of times, you know, we speak to, to citizens and laymen and, and people who are very pro-law enforcement and pro-rules and pro, um, you know, uh, um, the law, following the law. And I am, too. I'm one of those guys. But I still, being that type of person, think that this is crucial. This is one of the things that's crucial to our system of justice, because... Whenever somebody says to me, oh, but come on, Ed, the guy confessed just because they didn't tell him that he needed a lawyer. If they had told him he was a lawyer, he wouldn't have admitted what he did. Yes, you're probably right. But I always refi- remind people, Benjamin Franklin said it best. Our system of criminal justice is based on the theory that it is better that a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man is prosecuted. And that's why we have all these things in place. Not for the guy that commits the criminal, I mean, the the criminal act, not for the criminal, not for the people who do something wrong, but God forbid that there's an innocent person who is sucked into this system and they're not read their rights and they're not explained that they have a right to remain silent and things get twisted and they're innocent. So that's why these things are crucial. Even if you're very, you know, uh, um, an ardent supporter of the criminal justice system and people need to be, you know, sent to prison if they commit crimes. They're still very important in our criminal justice system. So So just to finish what I was saying, the other cases, in case anyone is interested, I'm not going to get into the facts and circumstances, but at the same time that Miranda was decided, there were three other cases that were decided at the same time. So it was a grouping of four. They all basically had the same issues. The other was Vignera versus New York, Westover versus United States and California versus Stewart. They were robber. All of those were different types of robbery cases, but they all boiled down to the same thing where confessions were secured by law enforcement without any formal uh, uh, notification to the person who was confessing before the confession that they had a right to remain silent pursuant to the Fifth Amendment and that they had a right to uh, counsel present pursuant to the Sixth. One more aside, and then we're going to jump into the meat and potatoes. You've heard me say this. This is episode 83. I've probably said this on virtually every episode. And if you follow me on any of my social media or know me in any way, then you know that one of my favorite hashtag Haber PA expressions is hashtag up X2. And hashtag up X2 is a modified acronym that's designed intentionally to remind you of a quick and easy way to remember to invoke up X2. Shut up and lawyer up. Invoke your fifth, invoke your sixth, because those are exactly what Miranda boils down to. So with that background, uh, let's get into a little more uh, meat and potatoes. Let's talk about what are Miranda rights. You guys want to pop up uh, slide number 
slide number one, please. To our producer. So that is what a Miranda card looks like. This is effectively what the police are required to read to any suspect. And we'll get into the when and how of it in a minute. But these are the, 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 these are the requirements. Number one, you have the right to remain silent. Two, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Three, you have the right to an attorney. Four, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Five, if you decide to answer questions now without an attorney present, you will still have the right to stop answering at any time until you talk to an attorney. Before the person waives those rights or invokes, they have to ask, do you understand the rights that I have just asked you? With these rights in mind, do you wish to speak with me? You can pop number one down now, please. Hey, Michael, just one thing with that slide up there. Um, you know, there's over 900 different versions of the Miranda rights. So you showed one, which is sort of a, a model. Generic. Yeah. But I mean, there's over 900 versions, which really range in difficulty and comprehending all the ways from second grade to college level. So there's such <laughs> sometimes it can be two different circuits right next to each other. I'm going to have widely different, you know, language in their Miranda waivers. So that's what makes it a challenge sometimes is that in one area, a person may be able to knowingly and intelligently waive, but not in the very next circuit. And then right. there's other issues. You know, we're going to get into that in a little bit in terms of factors that can affect this and things that you would look to identify. But, you know, just think about the fact that we have right here in Dade County, how many people don't speak English? How many people English is not their first language? You know, how, what happens if you don't have a Russian officer on duty, yet you have a Russian defendant taken into custody? That happens all and, the time here and, in Miami. And I'll add something that's even more real, very realistic. And I've heard it, Mike. I'm sure you've heard it. When we get these tape recorded interviews where the officers bring in another officer to speak Spanish. And I'm listening to this guy and I'm thinking, I'm fluent in Spanish, and I have no clue what this officer is talking about. His, his Spanish is horrific. No judgment. He's probably not his first language, but his Spanish is horrific. I'll hear the, the defendant say stuff sometimes, and I'm like, the officer didn't understand what he said. So even though they may want to bring an officer to try and translate or speak Spanish, let's say for the Spanish speakers in Dade County, sometimes they're not well, official translators, and the and defendants don't understand what, what's really going on. And also it, in that vein... There's so many different dialects of Spanish. So, you know, Cubans speak a very different Spanish than Spaniards speak, which is a very different Spanish than Argentinians speak. You know, so you have all those factors. Doc, I'm sorry. I look like you wanted to say something. Uh, I was just going to say, and, and that interpretation can affect the difficulty in comprehending the material. So right. two different police officers who both translate a, a confession, a, a Miranda waiver into Spanish, may use different words that increase the difficulty. So you can't base it just on the Miranda waiver in English. You have to see what the interpretation was in Spanish and how difficult that was to comprehend. So I want to just say one more thing about Ernesto Miranda. Um, when the Supreme Court reversed his conviction in Arizona State Court, the case went back to court in Arizona and was retried. The, the confession was excluded, and as you guys are going to learn, that's actually the remedy for a Miranda violation. Cases don't get dismissed. It's just that the confession itself, whatever it is that was illegal, is removed from the state's case. It can't be admitted. So Ernesto had to go back to have a second trial, and this time they tried his case, and the government did not introduce the illegal confession, but they had other evidence that they brought in, including somebody that he had also confessed to. So they had a third party come in and he was convicted a second time in state court. And he also got a very lengthy uh, prison sentence. However, he was uh, paroled early. He only served about three years on his second term before the Arizona authorities released him. And if you could put up slide number B, uh, I would appreciate that, producer, mm. because this is how Ernesto made a living afterwards. Slide number two, if you don't mind. That is an actual Miranda card from the mid 70s. Ernesto Miranda actually ran around autographing Miranda cards. I did not know that. And that is how he he literally how he made a living after being released from prison. Okay, you can yeah, go off, ahead and remove. Oftentimes when you show that people think that was just the signature of Ernesto Miranda on his Miranda rights, but right? that was actually he saw himself as a celebrity at that point in time. He, he kind of was. And even sold his autograph 
it even really got law, on. even law enforcement saw him as a celebrity. So that's interesting. And I just want to do say one more thing on this line before we go forward. And it's funny because every time I engage with a, a new police officer and I give them my business card, on the back of my business card, I have a Miranda rights invocation. And that is something for the defendant or the citizens, the public, not for law enforcement. So I always have to kind of jestingly say to the officer when I give him the card, this is for you, but don't ever read this as your Miranda warnings because it'll get you in trouble with your with your captain. Go right. ahead and put up image number three real quick. So that's actually my business card. And if you if you it's very hard to read on this screen. But the back of the card says Miranda writes invocation. And I'll just read it to you very quickly. And then we can move on. I hereby invoke my rights to remain silent and to meet with my attorney, Michael A. Haber. I will not talk about my case, answer any questions, respond to any accusations, take any field sobriety tests, take any intoxilizer or other breath, blood or urine tests. I want my lawyer, Michael A. Haber, to be present at this time. If you want to ask me any questions, search me or my property, do any tests, lineups, show-ups, or other identification procedures, then call my lawyer, Michael A. Haber. I do not consent to anything further without the presence of my lawyer, Michael A. Haber, and I am not waiving any of my rights. You can remove number three now. So the, the point being, again, and this is, if you take nothing else away from this show, take this. Only you can invoke your rights. Nobody else can do this for you. So when you're mano a mano with officer friendly, officer unfriendly, whatever it may happen to be, if you don't up X2, nobody can. All right, let's hop into our meat and potatoes at this point, gentlemen. So we've talked about uh, what Miranda <coughs> warnings are, why we have Miranda warnings. Um, Doc, I, we know the answer to the question, so I'm asking it rhetorically, but maybe you would be the better person to ask this. Is it, I, I'm asking the rhetoric question, is it necessary that Miranda warnings be read or must they be written? What's your take on oral versus written or both in terms of best practices and procedures? So, so both is ideal. Um, you don't know different people have different abilities, you know, from both reading as opposed to orally hearing things. So there's different abilities and different skills. People are usually anxious when they're in these settings, when they've been pulled aside by the police and put in a small room to talk to. So usually multiple sources um, of being able to provide these this data is the most important. So if you get both, you get the card put in front of the person, you don't know if they can read it or not, and then you actually say it to them, it increases the chances or probability. And there's some other things too, Michael, like – how it's read, the same Miranda warnings read in different ways can result in a person being able to comprehend or not comprehend. So you've got, you've got a whole series of factors, external and internal, that affect this. So how does it wind up where you get involved in the case? How, how do these things appear magically in your desk? Well, I'd say to both of you that not enough of these come into the hands of forensic psychologists. And I'm not saying that from a business standpoint. I'm just saying there's so many cases I'm involved in where I'm asked to do something else like mitigation or competency to proceed. And I see the person's given a full confession. And I say to the defense attorney, listen, I think your guy's intellectually disabled. And that confession, he may not have been able to understand his Miranda. So maybe you might want to consider that. Let me ask so, you this, Doc. Do you yep. ever make that recommendation to a state attorney? Do you ever say to the state, hey, by the way, I think there's a bad confession in this case? No, because I'm usually when I'm hired by a state attorney, it's usually after the defense has been involved and they're there they're, and they've already got something together. So they've already proposed all the issues they're going to propose. But that scenario, Michael, if I did think that, I would say that. Um, I haven't ever before, but I would certainly say that if I saw a scenario like that. But the case, when you're hired by the state, the, the case is usually pretty well worked up. By the time you're hired, you're, you're reactionary. You're reacting to defense uh, experts at that point in time. So normally when I get a case, if I have a, an issue like this and whatever the issue is, because they're, you know, again, I, I rambled off many of the things that many of the air courtrooms that you've practiced in. But what I did not tell the audience is in criminal court, the many different types of things that you do. So just, you know, briefly bear with me for one second. You testify with regards to issues of competence, meaning whether or not a given 
accused person is capable of proceeding within the parameters of the system. Do they understand the nature of the charges against them? Can they assist their defense lawyer in their own defense? You deal with in you deal with uh, uh, sanity issues, whether the defense or the state alleges that a person was sane or insane at the time of of a commission of a crime. Death penalty sentencing, statutory mitigation. You you mentioned uh, that's where we're trying to get the defense is trying to get the potential sentence lowered from the sentencing guidelines or to get minimum mandatories waived by the court. Uh, confession admissibility, of course. You also do integrity estimations for eyewitness testimony. You do calculations of child witness capacity, malingering tests, deception tests, recidivism and risk assessments. You have a very wide spectrum of things that you do. It's but, exhausting to hear all that, Michael. I know. Well, it, I, I'm tired. Of, I'm already <laughs> tired. I need a nap. Wow. I don't know how you do it, Doc. <laughs> it's very impressive. It's very impressive. And what's even more impressive is how effective you are in each and every one of those niche areas that some people only do one and you're able to so masterfully juggle uh, as many as you do. So I, let's stick in with, you. sticking with the, the, the admissibility of confessions. So Ed or I get a case, we have a client who, who gives a confession and we have some question as to the integrity of the confession. We come to you and say, Dr. Brannon, what can you do for us? What do you want to know? What do you need to hear? And, and where's your antennas going up? So the first thing I would say to you all, um, if you or Ed came forward for a case, I'd say, well, first know that what psychologists usually speak to, overwhelmingly speak to, is knowingly and intelligently and not voluntarily. Voluntarily usually has to do with some police um, misbehavior. If the police have done something outside of their usual interrogation methods or something illegal, something they can't do in terms of, you know, reading the Mirandas or not reading the Miranda rights or their force or, you know, threats or promises. So that usually is voluntary. And unless the expert has some specific training in that, then usually we're left with knowingly and intelligently. So if you and Ed came forward with a case, I'd be asking you things right away before I took the case about vulnerabilities. We know that some people have more vulnerabilities than others in regards to not being able to knowingly and intelligently waive their Miranda rights. And I know we'll talk more about these, but just a quick couple. So like low IQ, or learning disabilities where they have comprehension difficulties, um, any sort of neurological problems, head injuries, those kinds of things. Younger, um, younger people. And a lot of the early attention on Miranda waiver was people who were under the age of 16. So all of those factors become important. Mental illness is in there too, but usually waivers of Miranda have to do with intellectual issues, suggestibility and maturity, low IQ. Do, do, you know, Doc, can I, ask, can I ask one question? What about have you ever had a situation like this or, or what would happen if somebody is in the middle of a psychotic episode? I mean, they may look fine. If you don't know that person, you might just think that person's a, a difficult individual or whatever's happening. But the truth of the matter is that they're actually experiencing a psychotic episode. What could that affect and how would it affect their understanding Miranda? So, Ed, the legal system has not been, uh, the decision makers have not been so kind in regards to mental illness. Not that it's not a factor that shouldn't be considered, but if you just look at the Colorado v. Connolly case from 1986, um, which was a United States Supreme Court case, if you look at that case, there was an individual who was actively psychotic who walked up to a police officer on a street corner and, you know, made a confession um, and was Baker acted the next day. Um, he confessed to a murder. The next day, he's Baker acted. They say he's psychotic and not on his medication. And that confession um, was allowed to come in um, in the trial. So that person was actively psychotic. So usually when there is a waiver, what the courts have been the most friendly towards have been low IQ, autism, attention deficit disorder, low age, those kinds of things. Not that mental illness hasn't been an issue at times, but it's much more difficult. You know, I had a on, on, on that topic, many years ago, I had a case uh, where my client was, uh, my client left Miami, got on a bus, literally a bus, a Greyhound, and went all the way to Los Angeles, where he walked into the police department and confessed to a murder in Miami. And it turns out he had nothing to do with the murder, but he had read a reward poster. And he thought that by turning himself in somehow 3000 miles away, he would get the reward. And to him, this made perfectly good sense. 
And of course, these L.A. police officers reached out to Miami. Miami sent detectives right out to California. They took the guy, brought him back to Miami. They actually charged him. And ultimately, that those charges were dismissed because it was, you know, on its face so absurd. There was no physical evidence and all this, you know, you had was this crazy confession. Right. Well, and legally, just and this might be out of the realm of, of our our, our um, civilian uh, guests that watch the show. But legally, they wouldn't be able to use that confession regardless, because you still need the corpus delecti to get a confession in, which is a fancy Latin word that I paid. I'm one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt to find out that corpus delecti simply means a body of the crime. You actually need evidence of a crime before a prosecutor can introduce a confession. You know, Doc, in reviewing your materials before this show, I came across a, a, a slide that you have called Fun Facts You Should Know by Dr. Alan Goldstein. Yes. And I think the audience might be interested to know that 80% of suspects waive their Miranda rights. Yeah. 50% Crazy. of suspects confess to crimes. 90% of juvenile suspects waive their rights. Less than 7% of juveniles refuse to speak to the police. As you indicated earlier in the show, there's more than 900 different versions of Miranda. Yeah. And reading comprehension of Miranda rights ranges from grade 2.8 to post-college. But the average reading comprehension for a Miranda raver suspect is, is grade 6.2. Yes. And we're talking about on that last point, Michael, you're talking about comprehension. Oftentimes people just think that means they can't read it. And they say, well, the police read it to them so they can understand it. It's really comprehension of the actual, whether it's read to them or they read it. It's their ability to comprehend those words. So when we measure and do these assessments, we're looking at their ability to comprehend that Miranda right, the way that it's written and read. So either way, there's still an issue of comprehension. And some people don't read or comprehend at a level of 6.2 or even 2.8 sometimes. Yeah, that's true. And even the ones that do, Doc, you'd be surprised, Mike. I'm sure this happens to you. I have had clients, I have had friends that I have ad nauseum to the point where I think I'm just being a nuisance. Explain to them, do not talk to the cops. And sure enough, sooner or later, I'll get the phone call and I'll be like, oh, my God, you got arrested. Yeah, OK, so did you what happened? You didn't talk to him, right? Well, like I literally have told you, do not talk to these people. And yet they talk. They always talk. I don't get it. As I'm looking through again, going through your slides, Doc, and your red flags for evaluation. Again, you've mentioned a few of them. Um, let's let's hit on those a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. So, <laughs> so there's a number of different red flags. There's more than I'm going to uh, list here. There's and, a number. Uh, before of them, you like say them, actually, tell the audience when when we use that word red flags, what does that mean? What what is that means? What things to? that should should make you aware there could be a legal issue, and in this case, a Miranda waiver issue that the person may not have been able to competently waive their Miranda rights. So waiving your Miranda rights is another competency. You mentioned competency evaluations before. There's competency to proceed, competency to waive Miranda, competency to testify. Well, there's some red flags that may suggest that a person cannot competently waive their Miranda rights, specifically in the knowingly and intelligently prongs. So let me just break those down for a minute. Knowingly just means you know what's being said to you. So I have you have the right to remain silent. I know what that means when they said that to me. So that's knowingly. You have the right to an attorney. You can't afford one. So I know what you've said to me. I understand when you those say, words. So how do you how do you determine knowingly? Like do you, like would you ask a subject, you know, uh, I'm showing you a picture. What is it? And that person says, oh, that's a duck. And it's in fact a duck. That means that person knows what a duck is. I mean, how do you determine knowingly? So there's a number of different, I'm sure we'll talk about this later. There's a number of different instruments that we can use to assess a person's ability to understand Miranda rights by just asking them, what does this mean? What do these words mean? Are these similar or different than these Miranda rights? So we can do that, a structured um, setting. We can do a comprehension test with them. There's psychological tests like the wide range achievement tests, which I don't want to you know, bog your audience down with that, but they measure a person's ability to read as well as comprehend. 
So you'd want to get that information. You can actually get a grade level. Like I can get a grade level of the person comprehends at the 3.2 level. And if the Miranda is written at a 4.6 level of comprehension, right away, you know, that's a red flag. That person may not have been able to understand their Miranda rights. It's not just that, though, Michael. I mean, there's a lot of other things that you have to do to find out if they comprehend it. Like one of the things that's oftentimes missed both Michael and Ed um, is that evaluators don't listen to the whole confession. So if a person has trouble with their Miranda rights comprehending that, you, they just may say yes to each one. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand? Yes. Do you understand? Yes. When they really don't. But where you find out they have difficulty is in the rest of the confession. So they answer questions irrelevantly. They have to ask them to repeat it. They don't give a full answer. They just shake their head. So the rest of the interview can give you good information for how well that person does a verbal give and take and understands and follows through on what's being asked of them. I would think that a lot of that is also you have a, you have a, a uh, I'll call it just for lack of a better term, an intimidation factor. You know, when you're when you're being questioned by law enforcement, you're usually not sitting in the comfort of your own couch, drinking a cup of coffee or a glass of Bordeaux. You know, you're, you're maybe handcuffed you know, maybe surrounded by squad cars with flashing lights on the roadside. Maybe you're in a police interrogation room. Uh, you know, you, you, you are definitely aware of the authority around you. And there's a, there's a, I think a lot of people have a, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of people have a, a, a psychological instinct, a default instinct to acquiesce to authority. Although before you answer that, Doc, you can finish drinking. I personally would like to be able to have the opportunity one day in my life to be questioned by police officers while I'm sitting down drinking on a Bordeaux. You know what I'm saying? I would just love that opportunity to put my feet up on their table, sip it on a glass of wine and going, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> right. Well, you have to remember too, that police officers are very well trained. Most of them in a technique called the read technique. Um, about 90%, if not more, departments across the country use the read or a variation of the read technique. I have training in that, and I'm glad that I got it to be able to understand what a powerful tool that is. Actually, from the read uh, school, I actually got the training. So is that two E's? R-E-E-D? R-E-I-D. Um, it's called the read technique, um, and it's been taught now for decades. It was a response to, you know, physical abuse and persuasion and coercion. So this was psychological coercion. And it's a very effective way of questioning to get accurate confessions, but it also is a very effective way of getting some false confessions. And it really does purposely change the balance in the room. All the things that Michael was saying earlier, you're sitting in a small room, there's no windows a lot of times, the police officer's sitting very close to you, really on top of you. They're telling you they know what happened, they just need you to fill in the details. So there's a whole regimented set of steps that are very powerful in terms of inducing that person, enticing them, um, really putting them in situations where they're convinced it's better that they talk, even if their attorney told them don't talk, that it's in their best interest to actually talk to the nice police officer. Correct. I tell my clients all the time, officers are not looking to talk. Like when my clients call Michael, right, they'll call us sometimes and say, oh, listen, uh, a, an officer called me. He'd like me to come down to the station to talk to him about something. He wants to find out what happened. With, I'm like, no, he's only asking you to come down to see if you're going to confess. Why do you, I tell him all the time. I'm telling you, they know if they already know that you committed the crime, there's no reason to talk to you. There's only one reason they want to talk to you. They're trying to see if you will confess. Well, the other, the other, the other thing is there's the secondary goal to that is if they get you to the station, they don't have to worry about the, the risks of arresting you at your own house. True. They've already got you at the station. True. True. <laughs> but we can always arrange for a surrender without the client but, talking. You know, it's, there's also the other, the other aspect to that is also that, you know, unfortunately, while Miranda, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court offered some protection to citizens with regard to Miranda. <laughs> They're talking out of both sides of their mouth oftentimes because the Supreme Court is also also absolutely unequivocally authorized law enforcement to lie. They are allowed to deceive you. Michael. Mislead you. Now, that is not a Michael. That is a fact. They Michael, are allowed. They, they call it a ruse. They don't call it a lie. It's called a ruse. They can call it whatever they want. They are allowed to lie to your face. They so are I allowed tell to my tell wife. You they but are I allowed love. to tell you that they are investigating X when they are in fact investigating Y. 
They are allowed to tell that you that you are giving a statement about Z when in fact they are investigating C. So th they do not need to be honest and upfront with you, which again is why only you can up X2. That's right. And the Supreme so, Court has called it a ruse. When my wife says, are you lying to me? I'm like, nope. It's a that ruse. Was a, that was a ruse, honey. It wasn't a lie. It was a ruse. And so Michael, the U.S. Supreme Court says that's okay. <laughs> Michael and Ed, my favorite one that I've heard in, in all of the many, many Miranda waivers I've heard and confessions that I've heard was a police officer told a gentleman who was charged with uh, robbing a patron at a bank at night, about 9 o'clock at night. They were withdrawing some money in this Allegedly, this person was uh, had robbed them at gunpoint. And the police officer said in trying to get this confession was someone who was saying, no, 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 it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. He said, I just want to let you know that we already know you did this um, because there was a satellite that was flying over the bank at that particular time that had a magnified lens right on the spot of where you did this and specifically saw you and your face at the time this incident happened. And the guy confessed. Right. It Doc, couldn't have been, wanna, he, right. It couldn't have been me because I was wearing a mask. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. This is now. This is. I'm not joking. All joking aside, I want to ask you a question because the reason that the, the Supreme Court says that officers can use a ruse or lie to you if they're trying to get a confession, this is their rationale. Now, you tell me if, if psychologically, as as a forensic psychologist, this is true because an innocent person is according to the Supreme Court now. They feel that an innocent person would never confess to a crime they didn't actually commit. Now, true, not true. What are your feelings on that? Well, we just know uh, Barry Sheck would be flipping, you know, jumping up and down right now in the Innocence Project because we had people um, there who were on death row who actually gave confessions to crimes. The DNA proved they weren't anywhere near the area where there was eyewitnesses who claimed they saw that person eyeball to eyeball when there was no chance that person could have been there. So things happen, and we're not saying those happen all the time or even most of the time, right. but things can happen that have to do with how Miranda is read and how that person is interrogated and what the evidence seems to be as opposed to what the evidence really is. And like you said, and I go back to what Ben Franklin said, things happen. But in this criminal justice system, it's better a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent this thing happened to man is convicted. That you brought up the Innocence Project, I, I did a blog post on that last week. I actually mentioned them and gave a, a shout out to Barry Sheck et al. Um, they did a study of 375 uh, cases that had, that had false convictions. And of those, almost 275 of them were based on eyewitness identification. Eyewitness identification is, is one of the most damning pieces of evidence in a trial courtroom but it is also one of the most notoriously unreliable forms of evidence in a courtroom. And that is a, a, a really tough balance to make because prosecutors get up there and tout it and defense attorneys have to try and tear it down. So in my, in my blog post, I talked a little bit about my cousin <laughs> Vinny and the cross-examination of Constance Riley, who was the elderly uh, African-American lady with the glasses and how he used the tape measure and went back and held up the fingers to ask how many fingers, because her eyewitness identification was crucial for the, the arrest and prosecution. So we see this an awful lot. And, and just, I know it's a little bit of a tangent, Doc, but you, know, you do this as well. Um, factors such as brain biology, the malleability of human memory, um, the fact that the human brain physiologically likes to fill in gaps when there are memory gaps, they create, sometimes we organically create false memories of our own, as well as, uh, you know, human limitations such as Constance Riley's eyes or environmental factors such as the, I can't remember the other character's name, but the guy who couldn't see through the crusty window with all the trees and the leaves and the little things on the trees and the bushes. And don't forget that bush. Um, then there's, you know, negligence. Things happen negligently sometimes. Police officers do a lineup or a show up and they just don't have the right cues or they're not as good at separating the visuals. They don't have as many similarly looking individuals and there's actual malice. But how do those things factor in in terms of these, in terms of our subject? So, Michael, just to back up to how you started that, it's the most difficult thing for a defense attorney to deal with when someone says in a confession, I did it. 
I did that. When the outcome of that is I did it, it's hard to get a jury to believe this person who said they did it didn't do it. Or conversely, the last part of what you said, it's very difficult to get someone to not believe a witness who said, I saw him. I was sitting right there and I looked right in his face and I saw him. And that's the guy sitting right over there. So it's very hard for um, for attorneys, defense attorneys to have to deal with that. But some of those times they're incorrect. As you mentioned, the Barry Sheck statistics there a little while ago exactly. from the Innocence Projects, sometimes they're wrong. There's a lot of factors that can influence not only whether or not someone gives a confession and whether or not they understand their Miranda rights, but how accurately they can perceive something. There's many, many factors that affect it, Michael. Some you mentioned, also the amount of stress there people are under at the time, the time of exposure. Um, was there a weapon involved at the time? Did they feel threatened at the time? Um, is it cross-racial identification? Is it a white person trying to identify a black person or a Hispanic person trying to identify a white person? But mention that, Doc, because I don't think people realize. I read a study, I saw a study once where it showed that cross-racial identification is is... I don't want to phrase this delicately. I don't want to misquote it, but it's oftentimes it, inaccurate. That's you know, just, just like we, we are more apt to be able to notice the nuance and subtle differences of someone of our own race than we are. And of gender. Race. Right. And it has nothing to do with black or white or anything. It could be an Asian with an, a, a, a Caucasian, a Caucasian with an, it's, it's just our own race, right? It's, it's easier to identify. It. So you're better able to identify people like yourself a, because you look at yourself in the mirror every day, um, but also you tend to associate with people, most people tend to associate with people more often than not like themselves. So that's the case, unless you're an athlete where you have an exposure to a lot of different people. But um, that's why we identify people like us better. So, you know, a Caucasian male, I'd be the best at describing. As um, another can, can I offer an anecdote that actually happened to me many, many years ago, which shows you how even when you're intimately familiar with someone, you still may misidentify them. Years ago, I was about 19 or 20 years old, and I was at a club, and a girl comes up to me, and my name is Ed or Eddie back then, and she said, hi, Eddie. I've never seen this woman in my life. And I was like, hi. She goes, you know, I saw you riding your bicycle yesterday in the Grove, and I'm like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know you. I don't have a bicycle, and I certainly wasn't riding in the Grove. And she got mad very quickly and slapped me. And I had no idea what that was about. So a couple of weekends later, I'm at the same club with another girl, you know, a friend of mine. I'm talking to some girl. Her friend is there, and she's just staring at me like I have three heads. To the point where I finally look at her, I said, can I ask you what, what, what is it that you're looking at? She says, my God, you look exactly like a friend of mine. Like, you guys could be twins. And I said, let me guess. His name is Eddie, and he rides a bike in the Grove. So the girl who was intimate, she got she got upset with me because she was intimate with that guy. They had actually been intimate. So she's thinking, how can you be intimate with me? And now you're denying that you know me. This was a woman who was intimate and she mistook me for him. Meanwhile, my friend's friend, she could tell that I was not him. Yep. So and, and, and I want you to know, Michael and I don't believe you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we think you're malingering, but I just want to... Why would I deny that? was a very you know, attractive on, on woman. That, I would not have denied having sex with her. On that, <laughs> on that, on that last point on this, because we've, we've run a bit astray for which I take responsibility, but I do want to mention one thing to the audience, because eyewitness identification is an absolutely fascinating subject. And, th and I'm going to make a recommendation to you if you have an interest in it. This is a really simple easy to read way to understand this in a very real world context. There's a book called Picking Cotton. Two words, Picking Cotton. It is a story written by a woman named Jennifer Thompson and a man named Ronald Cotton. Jennifer Thompson was raped. She positively identified Ronald Cotton as being her rapist. She testified against him. He was convicted. He was sentenced to prison. He appealed. He got a new trial. He was convicted a second time and sentenced to prison, all based on eyewitness ID. Ultimately, he was DNA exonerated of the crime. The two of them wound up meeting on the talk show circuit, and they actually developed a bond and a friendship, and they wrote this book together. She had to forgive herself for putting him behind bars, and he had to forgive her for putting him behind bars, both being completely honest with what had happened. So... Picking Cotton, it's a, an absolutely fascinating read that anybody can get into. It's not scientific. It's not, techno, uh, you know, uh, uh, brainy. 
It's just a, a true story and a fascinating read. Michael, there's a rich body of empirical research on eyewitness identification. Um, and it goes all the way back to Elizabeth Loftus four decades ago. Um, but you, and you can actually see her on, uh, on YouTube um, giving lectures on this. But there's been a, an extremely rich body, the American uh, Psychological Society, American Psychology, uh, let's see, American Society of Psychology and the Law um, has done a lot of research in this area. And you can actually see that there's a breakdown of when mistakes are made and where they get, can get made. Some are systems variables that have to do with how the identification was made, like a show up. Um, the, you know, the, the witness gets there and the guy's there, you know, there's four police cars and he's handcuffed. And he's sitting on the ground. He's out of breath huffing. They say, is that the guy? Um, so show ups is one way that maybe can cause us to doubt a confession. And then the other things I was talking about before is estimator variables that has to do with the exact circumstances, how long you were exposed. Was there a weapon focus? Were you afraid? All of those things, cross racial identification, all of those things can factor into an, ina an inaccurate eyewitness identification. Yep. So let's get let's get back to uh, confessions. Let's talk about some of your um your, your issues that you use for, uh, for, for evaluating these types of, uh, what do you call them? Maver waiver evaluations. Yes. Yes. So, so what, what they really base down to Michael is, you know, are, you're assessing an individual for any sort of problem or difficulty that they may be having that could interfere in their ability to understand their Miranda rights. And sometimes it's just the way that it was read to them, um, like all of the Miranda rights being read together all at once or being read rapidly or a statement by the police about, you know, you've seen this on TV before. You really don't have to worry or listen to this. I just got to say it. It's just a requirement that I have. So here it is. So those kinds of presentations oftentimes can result in difficulties and problems, even for people without specific deficits. But then when you assess somebody, like, again, let's take the scenario of you and Ed send me a case and say, did this person have problems knowingly and intelligently waving? I'd want to do a couple of things. I'd want to do an achievement test to see what their reading and comprehension abilities were. I'd want to do an IQ test to see where their IQ measure was. So are they functioning in intellectually disabled or borderline range? I'd want to do a suggestibility test. I want to see exactly how suggestible are they to going along with authority and what someone else wants them to do. And I'd also want to do some kind of measure um, that has to do with Miranda rights. There's a number of different ones. And what they do is basically give you information about how a person performs on a Miranda-like instrument, like a standard Miranda warnings that you read before, Michael. So mm -hmm. this would be exactly that and gives a person a number of different exercises and how well they understand it, but also apply it. I before mentioned knowingly, that's just knowing what a person's saying to you, intelligently is applying that to your situation. So all of these Miranda rights instruments have that, those qualities intact, identifying if the person just knows what's being read. What does this mean? You have the right to remain silent. Tell me in your own words what that means, okay? But being able to apply it to your own situation a series of photographs are shown to the person of various legal themes, and they're asked questions about how this person should or shouldn't behave based upon their Miranda rights. So you're seeing the application of it, the intelligent application of it. So those things are very important in assessing and seeing if there's deficits, which may prevent a person from competently waiving their so Miranda rights. To, to capsulize all that, basically what happens in a given case is, you hope that you have a lawyer when you get in trouble and you need to hire an attorney or you're appointed an attorney if you can't afford one. You hope that your lawyer is attuned to understanding these types of issues because when Ed or I review a case and we see there's a confession, the first thing we do is our own evaluation to decide whether or not there's an issue here. Number one, sometimes confessions are not harmful. Sometimes confessions are actually helpful and the state wants to exclude them because they're self-serving statements. So, you know, and, and, and there are rules against allowing those types of self-serving statements to come in. But when we see a problem and we bring in Dr. Brannon and say, Doc, help us, you then need to meet, the, you need to review the materials. We have to provide you with the discovery. You have to see, hear, if it's video, if it's audio, if there are written uh, documents, then you need to meet the client directly, correct? And you have to conduct your own examination right. using any of a number of series of instruments that you may determine 
are going to be relevant to your assessment of that particular case. Correct. And if you can get other sources of information too, like school records, um, if they're available, or if you can get collateral sources of information, people who that, you know, know this person well and can tell you about their adaptive skills and can they take care of themselves and function out there. So all those things are important additional sources of information that you should avail yourself and of. And when it comes to, to expert witnesses and, and Dr. Brannon, again, he's an expert witness as a forensic psychologist, but there's all sorts of other types of expert witnesses. But the rules are all pretty much the same with regards to experts. Doc, tell us what makes you an expert. I mean, not in your particular area, but what makes an expert an expert? So really should have sufficient training and experience in the areas that you're going to practice. And that's an ethical standard um, in the American Psychological Association is that those areas that you all mentioned there, Michael, if, if uh, before that I do, I have to be able to show on my CV or through testimony that I have sufficient training and experience and understand those issues and maybe even understand some of the relevant case um, cases that are involved in those specific legal issues. So all of that is important and makes you an expert, although you don't determine if you're an expert. Um, but basically, that's what you have to be able to do is have sufficient training experience and be able to assess in the way that's going to address the legal. And issue. then we have to proffer you to a judge. Sometimes the state attorney will stipulate, for example, if we bring you in as an expert, it's very rare. I can't imagine here in Dade or Broward, especially that any state attorney would ever challenge your ability to be an expert since they hire you as an expert every chance they get. But and you also teach trainings for the state attorneys and the public defenders in, in Dade and Broward, correct? And judges yeah. as well. So it'd yes. be very difficult for them to challenge your expertise. But still, a given expert, we have to proffer that person as an expert. Of course, the other side can stipulate or they can wadir you. They can actually question you on the record to challenge my and cousin Vinny and determine your expertise right another my cousin Vinny when when his fiance uh, was I, challenged as, a, as an expert and um, the prosecutor asked Sarah right, about Mr. the, Trotter, uh, the right? what is that uh, what is the uh, the um, timing for That's top a bullshit that question <laughs> right so but then ultimately what makes an expert so important and integral to a given case and again this this could be any type it could be a handwriting expert could be a DNA expert. Whatever the expert is, the thing that differentiates an expert witness from any other witness is that you are allowed to give an opinion. Every other witness that takes a stand who is not an expert is only allowed to testify as to facts within their orbit of knowledge, things that they know or believe based on firsthand knowledge, not speculation, guesswork, maybe. Opinions are the strict province of an expert witness. So yeah, that, that, that kind of takes you to where you are in terms of how you get there. Tell me something about I, one of your slides that I enjoyed was the Pinocchio effect. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so you want to be sure that um, that the person is being honest and straightforward with you when you're conducting an evaluation. And there's, of course, a lot of motivation in the legal system, whether you're on the, the family side or whether you're on the personal injury side or whether you're on the criminal side, there's motivation to appear to be different than you really are. By the time you evaluate someone's uh, competency to waive their Miranda rights, they've done a lot of things. They've usually talked to their attorney a number of times. They usually talk to other people. They've talked to family members. So they kind of learn that it's not always best to appear mentally stable or to be intelligent. So at times people may try to fool you or what we call malingering or not put in good effort. And there's actually tests and measures that we can use to assess that. I would So any good forensic psychology evaluation really should include tests of effort as well as. I was just going to say, would it be fair to say that this is something you do routinely in pretty much every case? You need to be sure that when you're yes. offering an opinion on a case that you're not being bullshitted by the subject. And and. Right, that's not self-serving, self-report. And self in that case, you know, nobody expects you to be a human polygraph machine any more than they expect us to, but you actually have scientific tests that are designed to determine whether or not somebody is malingering. And am I correct in saying that apart from those specific malingering instruments, most of these tests have built-in malingering instruments inside of them? So the ones that we use uh, most often um, in the legal system, yes, have built-in validity scales, like... The Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, third edition, and other similar personality tests 
have response scales in there that give you some indication of how a person is answering questions. Are they randomly responding like tic-tac-toeing or minimizing and denying problems like in family cases? Or are they exaggerating problems and difficulties when they're trying to escape from criminal prosecution? So all of those things can happen just like in a Miranda waiver evaluation. People can feign having a low IQ or not being able to understand things But when you hear their jail telephone calls, they appear to have good comprehension and ability to be able to talk back and forth in Queens English to their family. And so because you're, you know, look, I know you always want to do a good job in every case, no matter who hires you and no matter what type of case it is. But I think it's fair to say that that your primary concern, even above and beyond the given case, is your integrity, because that affects you across the spectrum of everything that you do. So no matter who hires you, whether it's the the defense to try and suppress a confession, or I suppose you could be hired by the state to debunk an argument that a confession should be suppressed. Either way, you want as much valid (coughs) validity to your assessment so that you can opine in a way that your integrity is not assailed, right? So that's why you would want, if there are jail calls, you want to hear them. You want to talk to the guy's football coach. You want to talk to the cheerleading coach. You want to talk to the redheaded aunt. Anybody who can give you collateral information and other insight, which will either support or maybe negate uh, the, the, the assessment that you're doing in that moment. Yeah. Well, Michael and Michael and Ed, I, I see it as the, the stakes are very high. And let's just talk about criminal, though you say the same for family and personal injury, but it's different criminally. You're talking about someone's freedom. <laughs> So it's important, it's important you get it right um, and to the very best of your ability. And I see that the players involved, even if the defense hires me, the prosecution as well, and the judge, they expect me to do everything I possibly can to get it right. Even though they may not agree with it or may not like the answer I come up with, they have an expectation I'm going to work hard to try to get it right and consider every single thing I have to offer that to them. So I, I consider that the, a privilege to be involved in that kind of a system. But I think that's the work ethic you have to aspire to. I want to, to. share one, one brief uh, experience that I had with a, a confession case early in my career. I was appointed, court appointed as a special public defender to a guy who had a series of 18 or 19 concurrently charged uh, burglaries. Some of them occupied, some of them unoccupied uh, So some of these were life felonies that he was looking at. Some of them were armed. Some of them were not armed. But the point at the the point of it was that he got taken into custody during the course of an armed occupied burglary. So his primary case was a no bond, first degree punishable by life felony. They brought him back to the Miami Beach police station. And because of the where and, and timing and the location of the burglary, they had 17 or 18, whatever it was, other unsolved burglaries. And so they decided to question him as to each and every one of those while they had him in a room. And they went through all of them by case number, date and time. You know, so I want to talk to you now about Miami Beach Police Department case number 92-12345, which occurred at 3.41 a.m. on June 12th of 1994. Do you remember that? Yes. Did you do that? Yes. Did you steal this? Yes. Well, while they're going through this whole thing, and there's no video back then, it's just audio recorded. While they're going through the whole thing, at one point you hear a loud crash and the officer screaming, holy shit, call fire rescue. Turns out the guy had just literally passed out, blacked out in the middle of this interaction. And his head went right into the corner of the desk, got split open. They had to bring fire rescue in to suture the guy up. They had they asked wow. him if he wanted to keep going. And he said, sure. And he just kept rambling on. Meantime, paramedics did a blood draw on this guy. And his toxicology, he was loaded. This guy was like a pharmacy. He had so many different substances in him. And they pumped him full of coffee during the interview multiple times. You, Do you want another cup of coffee, sir? Will that help you to keep going, sir? Yes. Basically, the only words that ever came out of this guy's mouth were yes. The cops basically narrated everything. And, and of course, they rev- revived him with coffee and fire rescue. Ultimately, we were able to get every one of those confessions thrown out because I hired a forensic toxicologist, uh, excuse me, a psychopharmacologist. So this was a guy with a PhD in psychology and pharmacology. He was also a toxicologist. Yep. 
And he was able to help me to get that confession thrown out. Of course, the guy still had to, to wind up dealing with the first degree PBL occupied armed burglary that he was actually caught in the middle of. But it's a good example of how these things can, can go sideways. Um, the, the last thing that I want to throw out here, just to make sure that everybody understands, I know I said it once, but I want to say it again. If the police do not read you, we, we actually didn't say this. So let me just clarify it. You only need to be read Miranda if two things are occurring at the same time. Number one, you are in police custody. That means you are not free to leave. So if an officer stops you and says, hey, Martinez, hey, Brandon, do you have a minute? I want to talk to you. And you're able to say to them, no, thanks, and turn around and walk away and there's nothing they can do about it. You're not in custody. If you decide to stay there and engage the cops freely and voluntarily, you are not necessarily in custody. So number one, you must be in custody. And number two, while you are in custody, you must be questioned. About, so those, about the crime, because they can ask you your name, they can ask you where you live, but if they question you about the crime, I mean, they have to question. So I always like to tell my clients it's and, and colleagues, because believe it or not, Michael, am I wrong? There are some lawyers and judges who don't understand this. It is custodial interrogation all one phrase it's got to be all of it otherwise they do not have to read you miranda and if they do and if they and if you are in custody and you are being interrogated and they didn't read you miranda if it is an actual legitimate miranda violation forgetting whether it's even if the cops do it right and dr brandon's able to show that because of a mental defect or you know whatever it may be you were incapable of knowing involuntary waiver Whatever the circumstance may be, if it's blatantly constitutionally illegal or if you have a, a bona fide uh, psychological basis to set it aside, the case doesn't get dismissed. Right. It's not a dismissal. That is not the remedy for a Miranda violation. The remedy for a Miranda violation is suppression of the illegally obtained statement. That's it. That's the only thing that gets thrown out of the case. And if you don't believe me, you can go back and ask Ernesto Miranda because he was tried again. He was convicted again. The second time they weren't allowed to use the confession. Um, Michael, it's too late to ask him. He's well, passed we could, away. We could break out the Ouija board or have a seance. Okay. Could always go that route. I know that's parapsychology. <laughs> you wouldn't happen to be an expert in that, would you, Doc? No, we no, got I, I don't have my training we, or experience. We're going to have to call Dr. Venkman in for that one. We need <laughs> Bill Murray for that one. Um, is exactly. there anything you'd like to add, Doc, before we close up? I know we've done a couple. Of yeah, I just over. think one one very quick thing. I know you're at the end. So one very quick thing. We'd be remiss and we just hit it on, on it quickly. But age is a key red flag and factor. So anyone under the age of 16, even of average intelligence, should be always considered as to whether or not they can waive their Miranda. How come? We have all this rich body of legal knowledge now with the Miller case, the Graham case, um, the, the Roper case. So you look at those cases that really talk about brain development, and we know that kids' brains under the age of 16 or even under the age of 24, but especially under the age of 16, are not the same as an adult brain in terms of their ability to appreciate and concentrate and understand and focus on what they're doing. So age is a key variable. So juveniles should always, you should always give a thought about whether or not they actually intelligently and knowingly were able to waive their Miranda. And so just to end on that note, I want to just reiterate a couple of pro tips uh, number one, again, I've said it several times, but only you can hashtag up X2. Only you can lawyer up and shut up. If you have children, it's a great thing to teach them at a very young age, because if they don't know any better, they're likely to chat because that's the way kids are and they acquiesce to authority. In schools, by the way, they don't have to call parents. They don't have to bring you in. They're allowed to question your kids without you, without your knowledge, without your notice. And most kids are going to be uh, tend to yap because that's what the statistics tell us. So as a parent, it behooves you to have this conversation with your kid. God forbid you are ever confronted and you're accused. You're being questioned. Shut up. Tell them you're not talking without me there. I'm not talking to you without my mother or father here. That's fine. You can do that. You don't have to answer anyone. They're not going to beat you, tie you up, torture you. Uh, at least we hope they won't. And if they do, we'll get that confessed. As, we'll get that uh, tossed out as well. Um, so, so those are the tips. And then, of course, the last one is, uh, you know, think about expert witnesses because guys like Dr. Brandon are few and far between, but they are able on a, on a wide swath of issues to assist your lawyer to, uh, to affect you in, in a positive way in your case, whether it's getting a confession suppressed, 
whether it's, uh, you know, trying to get an insanity defense put forth. More oftentimes than not, what the doc and I co co uh, corroborate with is uh, statutory mitigation, trying to reduce sentences. You know, believe it or not, not every case is a winner for the defense. Sometimes we're dead on the facts, we're dead on the law, and, and all we can do is try and put lipstick on the pig, uh, which Dr. Brandon happens to also be an expert at uh, in, in, in his own way. So, Doc, on my CV. I want to thank you very you much for your time. Kind of I you want to thank you. On Winston. Winston. We, wow, there's the there's the podcast. Yeah, Winston guy. Churchill yeah. over there. Where's his cigar? <laughs> I want to thank you very much, Doc. I appreciate your time today, your expertise. I, I hope that the audience got an awful lot out of this. I know this is the third show you and I have done together. Uh, so yes, and I do appreciate it to, to both of I, you. I'm thank really you. glad that you that you gave your time, and um, I apologize to the audience for running over. One last brief programming no note before we hang up is. Uh, we do have a show next week. I'm certain that Ed will be there for that one, too, because uh, we have another guest that I am extremely excited to have on, and that is the honorable, recently retired Edward Newman, who is also a, a wow. member of the 1973 Super Bowl winning Dolphins. Um, he's going to come on and talk to us about his life story and his new book that was just published uh, called Warrior Judge. Uh, there are a couple warrior judges out there, not many, uh, two that I'm able to find in my search, but Ed's a great guy. He'll be with us next week. So I hope you'll join us for episode 84. That said, doc, you are our warrior expert. Yes, Thank you are. You. Thank you so Thank much. You so much for Thank your you time. Both. We really appreciate it. And I hope that everybody had a my good pleasure. time. We look forward to being back at your service next week for episode number 84. And Have I'll a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank again. you.